every church of Jesus Christ must focus on discipleship and it is the same for our church, Rock of Ages Church. Churches can have different visions and missions, but discipleship is non-negotiable. It is the responsibility of a church to disciple its flock to grow to spiritual majority such that the people uh, becomes more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ with each passing day. Discipleship in these last days are even more important. It is critical. It cannot be overemphasized. Why? Consider the Apostle Paul's warning about apostasy, the great falling away of the church just before the rapture, just before Christ returned. There are multiple reasons as to why uh, the apostasy will happen. And by the way, by the way, the apostasy has already begun to happen. But very few people are discerning that. What, what, vast swath of the church community have defected, uh, although they still call themselves church, but they have defected uh, for, for various reasons. It, is, it has been happening for a couple of years. It is happening right now, and things are going to get from bad to worse. Uh, so therefore, therefore, preparation for Christ's return is important. In the context of uh, where the contemporary church is today, one crucial area of preparation is to preach and teach the full gospel. Christians need to know the whole program of the redemptive plan of God. And Christians need to have a more complete, a complete understanding of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are familiar with what Jesus did in his first coming. It is crucial that they also know what he will do in his second coming. They know Jesus as the suffering Messiah, the suffering Savior in his first coming. It is also needful that Christians know uh, Jesus as a conquering king and an and, and uncompromising judge in his second coming. It is so important for Christians to know that while God is loving and full of mercy and full of grace, He is also holy, righteous and just. As such, God is angry. God is angry with sin and He will judge the unrepentant and the wicked without mercy. Without mercy. Unfortunately, too many contemporary Christians cannot accept this fact they cannot accept this truth about Jesus, that Jesus is capable of anger and fury and he will show his wrath when he judges the world during the tribulation at the end of this present age. What happens when Christians cannot accept this truth about Jesus Christ? Okay, it's a common thing right now. Okay, try talking to, to people about judgment and all that. A lot of Christians are not willing to face up to the fact that these things are said repeatedly in the Word of God. So the question here that I'm asking is, what happens when Christians cannot accept this truth about Jesus? Many things happen, all right? But I'll tell you a few things. They will be offended. They will be offended. They will reject this truth. Now, by doing so unwittingly, they are believing in a different Jesus and a different gospel. And that is dangerous. When you, when you believe in a different Jesus and a different gospel, not the one that is uh, 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 shown in the Bible, it is dangerous, very dangerous. When the terrible times prophesied in the Bible uh, 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 begins, and it will begin before the rapture and the tribulation, these Christians will be you prepared. They will be you prepared. Their hearts will grow cold. Their hearts will grow cold. Jesus said it. And their faith will falter and they will eventually turn away from the Lord. That's one of the ways in which the apostasy will happen. And therefore, we need to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Discipleship at the end of this present age is not just important, it is critical. It is critical. What do people worry and fear in this present time? People worry and fear over many different things. Global warming, 
war, geopolitics, geopolitical turmoil, terrorism, financial crisis, bank runs, economic collapse, moral chaos, and so on. I'm listing here just some of the macro issues that are facing the world presently. People are right to be concerned about these potentiality, potentialities, right? Except for global warming, okay? May I just say that? Except for global warming, you know my stand concerning global warming. It is a total farce, all right? It is an agenda, it is a political agenda uh, for control and so on, uh, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, but I just want to mention that. But what people should really fear is the wrath and the judgment of God that are looming in the horizon. Jesus will swing his sickle. He will tread the wine press of the fury and the wrath of God. The wicked will be judged. Unrepentant sinners will be judged. The enemies of God will be judged. <clears throat> Psalm 7, 11, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignant indignation every day. A God who feels indignation every day. Guys, every day. Okay, uh, let me read the NIV translation in simpler English so that you capture the essence of this verse. Okay, so in NIV it says, God is a righteous judge. A God who expresses his wrath every day. Every day. We know God is love every day. But this verse tells us that God is also angry every day, okay? For a good reason, of course. He's angry with sinners and the wicked every day. Let's bear this in mind, okay? Let's have a complete picture of Jesus. He's full of love and mercy and grace, but he's also a God of, <clears throat> a God of holiness, justice, and righteousness. And therefore, he's necessarily angry and furious and rough to, wrathful when, uh, when sin is concerned. So, let's look at Hebrews 10, verses 30 to 31. For we know God who say, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. Not just those other people, sinners and so on, okay, unrepentant, but the Lord will also judge His church. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is our God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our God. He's capable of wrath and therefore He's greatly to be feared. Throughout history, God shows His anger and, and, and wrath in various ways. You should be familiar with it if you read your Bible. Okay, not selectively. If you read your Bible, you should be familiar with the fury, with the anger, and with the wrath of God. But you might not have thought too much about it. Okay, so I'm going to show you uh, a, a various ways in which God <clears throat> shows His wrath, God shows His anger. First, there is a sowing and reaping wrath. The sowing and reaping wrath. Whatever you sow, that you will reap. It is logical, right? So if you sow papaya seeds, you will get papaya trees that will bear papaya fruits, right? You cannot be sowing papaya and you get durian, okay? Uh, uh, no free lunch, right? Uh, you, you, can't, you can't do that. So likewise, if you sow evil and wickedness, you will also weep evil and wickedness. Uh, a lot of Christians think that these are just pagan thoughts and so on, some, some uh, Chinese religious thoughts. No, this is a scriptural principle. It is a divine principle. Whatever you sow, you will also reap. Let me give you two scripture verses. Job 4, 8. As I have seen, Job say, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And then a familiar verse in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. You may be safe. I am safe, we are safe. Yet the principle will apply to us. Okay, if we sow good, we will reap good. If we sow evil, we will reap evil. Second, there is a cataclysmic wrath. It is a big scale judgment with severe consequences. And the effect may be felt over a wide region, even throughout the world. 
So let me give you some example, two examples. God sent a worldwide flood during the time of Noah in response to the corruption of the human gene pool and the wickedness of mankind, the utter wickedness of mankind. Billions died, yes, billions. Not just hundreds of thousands of people or millions. Billions died at that time. Uh, only Noah and his family of eight were saved in that outpouring of God's wrath and judgment. Another example is the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think we are all familiar with that. God rained sulfur and fire on these two cities in response to their blatant uh, uh, homosexual perversion. It's blatant homosexual perversion. All the inhabitants of these two cities perish except for Lord and his two daughters. Okay, the angels came, helped them to escape the city just before God uh, unleashed his fury and wrath on the cities. Third, there is a wrath of abandonment. Okay, uh, we have read about this, but I think many of us are unfamiliar with this. There is what we call the wrath of abandonment. The Apostle Paul talked about the wrath of abandonment in Romans chapter 1. On three different, uh, three different times, Paul used the phrase, God gave them up. Okay, remember that? Okay, you have read Romans chapter 1, God gave them up. God gave them up to their sin and depravity. Okay, God gave up this unrepentant sinners to their wanton sexual lust, homosexuality, and the depraved mind. For humanity or for a nation to come to a place whereby this thing become prevalent, okay, understand this, it is a judgment of God. It is a judgment of God. The idea here is God doesn't try to stop these persistent sinners anymore, but allows them to do whatever they please, so that they will suffer the deadly consequences of their sins. God gives them up to their sins. God refrains from restraining them. God allows them to do as they please. This is the wrath of abandonment. It is the wrath of God. Okay? It is the wrath of God. People ask, well, if God is real, why all this evil and wickedness? It is because God has abandoned them. It is because God is angry with that nation, angry with the community. It is a wrath of repentance. We see this divine wrath of, uh, of, of abandonment in full display now in the United States of America and in the West and in many developed and affluent countries. Gross immorality, rampant LGBT perversion and crazy delusional ideas are the new societal norm, new norms. These are the new societal norms. It is pure madness. People call it freedom and pro progressivism. But this is the judgment of God. This is the wrath of God. God has abandoned these nations. These nations are already in judgment or under judgment. The collapse of these nations will happen suddenly and quickly. We do not know when. Okay, throughout history, you see great civilizations like the Roman empires and all that collapse suddenly and quickly. And that's because sometimes we think about it, we think that, oh, economic reason, military reason, of course, all these plays a part when God takes them on, took them on a downhill move. But the important thing is, if you study history, you realize that they were moral decay there were cultural decadence and a lot of all these things that eventually leads to God's wrath and judgment. Fascinatingly, while God's wrath and judgment are taking place, God is also busily working over time to reach out to the lost, to save as many people as possible. Daily, we see this divine paradox at play. Reason? God is angry every day, but God is also loving every day. Well, he prefers, he prefers mercy to judgment, but He will do both, okay? He will do both because the character of God is that He's love and the character of God is also He's holy. And therefore, we see this paradox at play daily in our lives. 
So we have the sowing and reaping wrath. We have the cataclysmic wrath. We have uh, the wrath of abandonment. But God's wrath is not restricted to these three categories of wrath. There is one more category. In the Bible, uh, in the, Bible the prophets and the apostles, including Jesus, warn of another kind of wrath. And it is called eschatological wrath. Okay, you know the word eschatology, right? It's a study, the theology, the study of the end times and all the things that are associated with the end time. And this is called the eschatological wrath. The eschatological wrath will take place at the end of this present age and afterwards in eternity. A large portion of the book of Revelation is dedicated to talking about this eschatological wrath, which will take place in the last seven years of this present age, which we call the tribulation. By now, you ought to be familiar with what happened during the tribulation. During this time, God will unleash His wrath and judgments and there will be unprecedented troubles and disasters all over the world. All over the world. It is not going to be regional. The destruction and the disaster is not going to be, are not going to be regional. It is going to be worldwide in nature. Ultimately, ultimately, apart from these last seven years, all right, of God's wrath and judgment, ultimately, everyone who rejected Christ in in, in their lifetime, will have to face him in the great white throne judgment. These unrepentant sinners will be sentenced to eternal torment in the lake of fire, which we call hell. Now, let's look at the text for today. I thought we need to just set up certain context and all that so that uh, we, we understand. We understand what the wrath of God is really uh, all about. The, the, the wrath has been taking place historically and even presently. But uh, of course, there is the eschatological wrath which we're going to talk about in today's passage. So today's passage is taken from Revelation chapter 15. We are doing it expositionally and we are doing it, uh, you know, the, covering the whole of the book of Revelation. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, this is my first attempt uh, at such a long Series, okay. It has taken more than a year, and I'm still on it. It will continue for a couple more months, uh, but I trust that you are learning, learning much. So, chapter 15 of the book of Revelation is the shortest chapter, and therefore I will preach it at one go in one sermon. Okay, uh, never have I done that right for in the book of Revelation, chapter 15, eight verses. I'm going to preach it in one sermon. So let's read the text. Revelation 15. So this is John speaking. And then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plates, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O God, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come, and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I look, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plates, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plates of the seven angels were finished. So where do we think we are now? 
okay, in the chronological sequence in the book of Revelation. Of course, hey, Pastor, we're at chapter 15. But where exactly are we now in that, in that timeline of the seven-year tribulation? Okay, we are at a point when the seventh angel blows the number seven trumpet. We are at a point when the seventh angel blow the seventh trumpet. And for that, I got to take you back three chapters to chapter 11 and verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So the seventh trumpet is not accompanied by one judgment. Okay, instead, the seventh trumpet signals the beginning of a new series of judgment. Remember, there are three series of judgment. The seal judgment, the trumpet judgment, and then after that, the bow judgment. Okay, so the seventh trumpet signals the beginning of the bow judgment, the last series of judgments. Revelation chapter 11 connects directly to chapter 15. Revelation chapter 11 connects directly to chapter 15. At the end of chapter 11, the seventh trumpet is sounded. Chapter 15 then continues with the chronological events. It details the preparation in the heavenly temple of the seventh trumpet judgment or the seven bow series of judgment. Okay, so if you want to read chronologically, you skip chapter 12, 13, and 14 you connect directly from chapter 11 to chapter 15. So I say repeatedly in my previous sermons that Revelations chapter 12, 13, and 14 are an interlude. Okay, it is an interval or it is a pause. A pause whereby God gives us a better clarity, uh, uh, whereby God gives us important information to provide a better clarity of what happened before the seventh trumpet is sounded and also after the seventh trumpet is sounded. Okay, those are more information given to help us to appreciate what happened during this time so that we have a better understanding uh, of what transpired during this time. So the chronological sequence resumes in chapter, uh, chapter 15. In chapter 15, we read about the preparation in heaven before the bold ju judgments are released. And then, after that, we go on to chapter 16, and it's a description of each of the seven, uh, seven trumpet judgments. The details are given. Okay, not many details, but enough details are given for us to understand exactly what will be taking place when the seventh trumpet is blown or when the seven bow judgments are being unleashed. So today's text begins with John saying, Then I saw another sign in heaven. Another sign. And it is a great and amazing sign. Uh, what does that mean? Another sign simply means that previously John must have seen, John had seen, also seen other signs. Okay, if, can you remember that John see, saw other signs? Okay, in chapter 12, okay, it records for us these two other signs. Uh, the first sign is a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Okay, a crown. Remember that? Okay, the sign of the woman, a great sign. And then after that, John saw another sign, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on their heads, seven diadems. So I spoke in details the meaning uh, of these two signs uh, in two previous sermons. The woman represents Israel. A lot of people get it wrong. A lot of people say that the woman is the church, and therefore they get a lot of things in the book of Revelation wrong, even this whole thing about pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation rapture and so on, or whether the church is in the tribulation. The woman is clearly Israel, the nation of Israel and not the church. And then, the dragon represents Satan and the final global empire. Okay, that is generally agreed. A uh, few people dispute that. Of course, there are some who believe that these are nothing but alleg allegories. That means, oh, these are just pictures, metaphors to teach us about Christian living. No, no, these are, God is telling us 
his end time program, what will happen, what will transpire at the end of this present age. So, now, here we have in chapter 15, John saw another great sign. What is this sign? He saw seven angels with seven plates coming out of the sanctuary in the heavenly temple. Now, these seven angels, these are the seven angels that God will use to unleash the seven last judgments called the wrath of God, seven wrath judgments. And after that, the wrath of God is finished. Meaning, meaning that will be the end of the three series of terrible judgments. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bull's judgment. It will all come to an end. And by that, it means that the seven-year tribulation will also come to an end. And then, Jesus will come again in, the second, in his second coming and establish his rule on earth for 1,000 years. And that's what we call the millennial kingdom of Christ. Okay, millennium basically means a thousand, a thousand year. Okay, uh, there are two different scenes presented in chapter 15. Uh, why? Because John saw two different visions. So we're going to go through one vision at a time. The first one, we'll spend a little bit more time. The second one, a little bit less time. So let's read Revelation uh, verse 2 again of uh, chapter 15. And I saw what appeared to be a glass, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and the image and the number of his name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. <laughs> now, in the first scene, John saw a group of martyrs, okay, a group of martyrs standing before the throne of God. Question. Who are these martyrs? I mean, there are martyrs all over the place uh, during the seven-year tribulation. But this is a category of martyrs. So who are these martyrs? And it's been told to us in the passage that we have just read that these are those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. A specific group of martyrs, different from the one in Revelation chapter 6 under the table, no, not under the table, under the altar. <laughs> under the, don't, don't any else say, under the altar. Okay, it's a different, it's a different group of, of our, our tribulation martyrs here. Now, these are the souls of the believers. Souls. These are the souls of the believers, both Jews and Gentiles, who had conquered and overcome the Antichrist, refused to worship the Antichrist, and rejected the triple six Mark of the beast. Meaning to say, okay, uh, 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 wait, wait. Uh, the fact that this, they are standing before God in heaven means that they are dead. They are already dead. Okay? That's why I call them martyrs. Okay? You don't read the word martyrs in this passage here. That's why I call them martyrs. So, these are the tribulation saints who are killed at the midpoint of tribulation, or after the midpoint of tribulation, why did I say that? I say that because the Antichrist and the false prophet only force the worship of the Antichrist and people to take on the triple six mark of the beast only at the midpoint of tribulation and afterwards. Before that, no such thing happened. So this group of saints is different from the saints under the author that we read in Revelation 6. Okay, a different group. These are the group that have to better, that have to sort of resist the Antichrist and his, and his, uh, and his push to worship him and to take on the triple six mark of the beast. And you and I know we have gone through, we have gone through that in a sermon uh, when we go to Revelation chapter 12, that those who refuse to obey the Antichrist will be executed. They will be executed. So, I say earlier that these are the souls of the martyrs because they are not resurrected yet. And I, 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 I know that some of you may not be interested to go deep into this, but there are questions always being asked. Okay, therefore, let me say this. These are the souls of the martyrs because they are not resurrected yet. Their resurrection will happen later. Only after Christ has returned. 
after the second coming of Christ. Okay, let me give you a scripture verse here. Revelation 20 verses 4 to 5. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. Okay, all the martyrs during the tribulation and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or on their hands. Okay, this is the next category of tribulation saints, uh, martyrs. They came to life and reigned with Christ for 1,000 years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the 1,000 years were ended. This is the first resurrection. This is the resurrection of those who have died during the seven-year tribulation. Those who are martyred and died during the seven-year tribulation. A lot of people confuse this as a rapture. Uh, for the you know, mid to post tribulation, they, they, they like to use this scripture verse. This is the first right? No, no, no. This is the resurrection of the tribulation saints. Okay, the martyrs, those who have died during the seven-year tribulation, this is their resurrection. They are given a body, a glorified body, just like the church before the tribulation happened, they were taken up, we are given an imperishable glorified body. Okay, so I hope we can be clear about that. So John saw these martyrs standing beside a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, this is obviously not a real sea, not a real ocean. So what does this imagery mean? John saw this huge and beautiful crystal clear glass platform earlier, okay, earlier uh, before the seal judgment began, if you remember, okay. Before it began, we, we were ushered into, sort of shown the scene of the heavenly temple and then the 24 elders were there, the, cher the four cherubim were there, and people were singing and worship. And John saw this same scene of, of, the, of this crystal clear, huge platform before the throne of God. Moses and the 70 elders also saw it when they went up to Mount Sinai. And Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, also saw this huge expanse of crystal glass before the throne of God in the vision. Now, this shimmering crystal expanse displays the beauty and the glory and the majesty of God. I mean, you look at it, you will be like, oh, wow, you know. Uh, uh, but only John saw this crystal sea, this sea of glass mingled with fire. The rest of the people, or earlier even when John saw it, it was just the glass, sea of glass, no fire. Here it was mingled with fire. What does it mean? There are two possibilities. I'm not clear, but there are two possibilities. First, fire in the Bible is frequently associated with divine judgment. Okay? And a sea of glass mingled with fire probably portray God sitting on his throne, not like, uh, you know, uh, not, not as, a, uh, as, as a king in that sense, but as a judge an uncompromising judge who is ready to unleash his fierce wrath and judgment on the inhabitants of the earth. So Hebrew 12.29 says that God is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 10.26-27, to For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remain a sacrifice for sin but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume his adversaries. So we get all these imageries of fire. It is about judgment. And so this uh, majestic, splendid, uh, glorious looking expanse of sea of glass, uh, uh, I mean, it's so beautiful and yet it's mingled with fire probably shows that God is sitting on his throne as a judge, okay? The second possibility is fire here could refer to the fiery trials that the martyrs go through. Fires could refer to the fiery trial that the martyrs go through. First Peter 
1 verses 6 to 7, in this you rejoice, Peter said, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, okay, by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you see here in this passage that trials are equated with fire. Okay? Trials are equated with fire. When we go to trials, okay, it is God testing us with fire. And that's why sometimes we say certain afflictions that are very bad, we say these are fiery trials. Now the martyrs have literally gone through, the tribulation martyrs, these ones that are described in chapter 15, have literally gone through hell on earth. In the Olivet Discourse, this is how Jesus Christ described the trials and afflictions that the saints will go through during the Great Tribulation. That means during the second half of the Tribulation. Matthew 24, I'm going to read verses 21 to 22. For then there will be great tribulations such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. That's how bad it is. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time. Okay, I know there are people who likes to go through the tribulation. Oh, not scared of it. You know, uh, why are we worried? You know, throughout the ages, the church also go through tribulation. Yala, I know. If you've got no choice, we go through. But if you've got a choice, why you want to go through that? Don't be gung-ho, okay? It's worse than you think, okay? It's worse than you, you, and I, uh, you and I think. So, hats off to these martyrs. They refuse to worship the Antichrist at the pain of death. They refuse to take the triple six mark of the beast, which render them unable to buy and sell. They are cut off from their livelihood. Their bank accounts are seized or being suspended or terminated. They can't do anything. They can't buy, they can't sell, they can't do anything at all. Yet, they remain steadfast in their refusal to bow to the Antichrist until the end. Some are arrested and killed. Some die of hunger. Possibly they will die of hunger. Uh, many of these tribulation saints will come to a gruesome end. Yet John say that they conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. Okay, that's the word John, this is a phrase that John used. They conquered. They conquered the Antichrist. They conquered his name and they conquered uh, 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 the, its image and the number of his name. Now, question. Why did John say that they conquered the Antichrist when ultimately they die? I mean, when you, are, when you conquer, uh, whether, whether you play a computer game or if you are a military fellow, when you conquer a place, I mean, you don't die, right? Those who die and lose, lose the battle, right? Okay, but so why did John say that they conquer the beast and its image and the number of his name? when they ultimately die. That's because they stand steadfast to the end. That's because they endure to the end without wavering in their faith. That's because they persevere unto death without giving in to the Antichrist and his demands. In other words, they conquer through death. Okay, Christians must be aware of this idea. We can conquer through death. That's what many martyrs in church history have done. They conquer through death. So these martyrs, these tribulation martyrs, conquer through death. These martyrs standing, so these martyrs standing beside the glorious sea of glass mingled with fire is a fitting imagery of their victory over the most horrendous affliction that is ever inflicted upon mankind. And these tribulation martyrs conquered. They conquered through their death. So my dear brothers and sisters, genuine faith cannot be destroyed by the refiner's fire. It will only be purified by it. Adversity makes people without authentic faith bitter. 
but it makes those with it better. Okay, know this. Every suffering in our life is permitted by God for a purpose. It is to prove us. It is to test and refine our faith. Consider Job. It was God who instigated Satan to test the faith of Job. Do you know Job didn't just go to Job, uh, uh, Satan didn't just didn't go to God and say, I want to test, I want to test Job. It's God that instigated, go back and read chapter 1 of Job. It's God that instigated Satan to put Job's, te- uh, Job's faith to the test. So Job was put to, through fiery trials and he passed his tests with flying colors. In the same way, the tribulation martyrs in chapter 15 who stand up to the Antichrist also pass their tests with flying colors. And so here in chapter 15, we read that they stand before the glorious throne of God with God's approval. What did the martyrs do when they stand before the Lord? They, just, they didn't just stare at Him, right? What did they do? They sing, all right? They sing. Uh, let's read Revelation 15, verses 2 to 4 again. And I saw what appears to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of his name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, and they sing the servant, uh, uh, the servant of God, and they sing the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds. O Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Why do Christians sing whenever we gather? Even in small gatherings, we sing, we sing, right? In Sunday service, of course we sing. Why do we sing? Because we love singing. Because of tradition, because it is a ritual that has been passed down for 2,000 years, or because it is just to fill up a Sunday service program. No, we sing because Christ is in us, and we are in Christ, and because of that, we are always victorious. And therefore, we sing, and therefore, we praise, and therefore, we worship to express our gratefulness, and our thanksgiving. And this is exactly what the martyrs were doing as they stand before God. They have gone through a tremendous fiery ordeal. And now they are victorious. They have conquered. And they sing praise to God. And they, and, 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 they, and, they, and they worship Him. They have conquered the Antichrist and His image. They have conquered the number of His name. And what an irony it is, right? Conquest through death. Victory through death. This only holds true for believers of Jesus Christ because for us, death is not an end, death is not a defeat, but death is a conduit through which we move into the presence of God. And therefore, death by itself for a Christian, for a saint, is is a victory. It's a victory. It is a good thing, all right? We shouldn't be afraid of death. I know we are afraid. I, I, I often tell people, I'm not afraid of death. I'm only afraid of torture. <laughs> but I'm going to address that later on, all right? Uh, take comfort from the Word of God. So the martyrs now stand before the majestic throne of God and they sing three songs. I know it's a little bit confusing, but uh, generally scholars and commentators agree that they sing three songs. The first song is a song of Moses. The second song is a song of the Lamb. And then the third song is a doxology that we read uh, in today's passage. So why these three songs? Let's consider them one at a time. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, if you look at the you know, Exodus and Deuteronomy, you realize that there are two songs of Moses. And you know, as usual, all these scholars will argue over which song is it. And all. Today, I'm going to tell you which song I think it is, all right? Uh, they, sing, they sing the song of Moses. So, which one is it? Is it the one in Exodus chapter, uh, chap- uh, chapter 15 or the one in Deuteronomy chapter 32? Okay, let's see. The song of Moses in Deuteronomy starts off 
beautifully. Beautifully. Okay, uh, there's a song that is written uh, using these verses here. I use it, uh, we use it in our wedding uh, some 35 years ago. Uh, so it goes like this. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Great, right? A befitting song for the, for the tribulation martyrs to sing. But then as you continue to read the rest of the lyrics, you will quickly realize that it talks about Israel's unfaithfulness. It's a long song. It talks about Israel's unfaithfulness and, 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 and God threatening to punish them. Okay? Uh, and in fact, Moses stated the purpose of this song before uh, he sang the song or he get the people to sing the song. Uh, we look at verses 19 to 20 of Deuteronomy 31. Now therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. God instructed Mo instructing Moses here. Put it in their mouth that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give it to their forefathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and my covenant. So can this be the songs that the martyrs are singing? I don't think so, right? Maybe I should say certainly not. Okay, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into the occasion. It was a victorious occasion. They were celebrating. Uh, how can they be singing this song about God indicting uh, the, 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 the Israelites? Not possible. Uh, so, then next, let's consider the song in Song of Moses in Exodus 15. Uh, it, it goes like that. I'm going to pick out just a couple of verses here. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Now, this is only a portion of the song. The song is actually quite long. But it gives you the idea of the triumphant note in the song. It goes on throughout the song. And the song speaks about God's triumph over Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the salvation of the nation of Israel. And, and therefore, I believe that this is a song that the tribulation saints and martyrs sang before the throne of God. All right? So that, I think, settles it. Uh, cut through the chase about all these other small details in, the, in, 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 in all the arguments and all that. I think this is a song that they sing. The martyrs also sing the song of the Lamb. Most likely, this is the song that is sung by the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and the myriads upon myriads of angels in the throne room of God just before the seven seals judgment, judgments are being unleashed. Let's read a couple of those verses. Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, 12 to 13. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And, and when he sing this song, this is referring to them. God is making these martyrs a kingdom. Okay, a kingdom of kings and priests. And these other people, they are standing there waiting for these last judgments to be completed and then they will reign together with Christ for the next 1,000 years. And it continues in verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessings and honour and glory and might forever and ever. So you see here that the themes of this song of the lambs are salvation by the blood of the lamb, the worthiness of the lamb, and praise unto God and the lamb. 
Okay, I think this is a song because you can't find other song of the Lamb uh, in, in, in the book of Revelation anymore. Okay, and then the final song is a doxology. Basically, it is a praise and worship. It is a doxology. Let's read that again, verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 15. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God and the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So in this doxology, the martyrs praise God for His great and amazing deeds, for His, ho for, for his uh, ways of justice and truth, and for His holiness and for His righteous acts. Uh, I can preach a whole sermon on this doxology. There are many things to unpack here, uh, but obviously we have no time. But what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to make a comment on one of the things that is being mentioned in this song, in these lyrics here. And that's concerning God's great and amazing deeds. The mother praised God for His great and amazing deeds without which they will not have conquered and be victorious. Listen to this very carefully again. They praise Him. Okay, they praise Him for His amazing uh, and great and amazing deeds without which they would not have conquered the Antichrist uh, and be victorious. They recognize that they have managed to endure to the end and even unto death, not because of their sheer willpower and strength and abilities, but because of the grace of God. But simply because of the grace of God that is manifested through His great and amazing deeds. So my mind goes to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, a familiar verse. For God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now you and I do not have to go through the tribulation, but bear in mind that I've often said this, bear in mind that the time leading to the tribulation can also be ugly, can also be challenging, it can also be very, very difficult. And if we have to suffer great afflictions like what these tribulation martyrs have gone through, are we able to endure and remain faithful to the end? Are we able to endure and remain faithful to the end. Not by my own strength, for sure. But I will say this. I will trust in the grace of the Lord. I will trust in the grace of the Lord. Consider Stephen, or Stephen, however you want to pronounce it. He was stoned. It must have been a terrifying experience, frightening and painful. I mean, stones, right? So I play football, if the ball hit me, you know, you just got to uh, uh, move away quickly. But we are talking about stones raining down on him. It's a terrifying experience. Yet, he could calmly pray to God to receive his soul. Yet, he could calmly pray to God that God will forgive his persecutors, that God will forgive his nemesis. How is that even possible? How do we think that is possible? It is by the grace of God. Nothing else but by the grace of God. If you remember the story, it is said that Stephen was, and I quote, full of the Holy Spirit. It is said, and I quote, that he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. How amazing is that? In his dying moments, at a time when there's so much pain, fear and all that, the Lord allows him to see all this, the glorious scene in heaven and he was full of the Holy Spirit. God knows how to encourage and strengthen his faithful saints such that they will be victorious until the end. Now, even if you and I have to go through 
sufferings, tremendous afflictions, and even torture. I pray not, God forbid. <laughs> but, you, but you never know. Okay, God knows how to take us through. As long as we are faithful, God knows how to take us through and we will endure until the end. We will persevere until the end. Okay? We just got to trust in the grace of God. So, my dear friends, take comfort in that. I know that many of you who are clued in and will say that, yeah, Jesus is coming back and all these things, bad things are going to happen uh, and we are afraid. We are thinking of hiding, we are thinking of running, but unless the Lord asks you to do so. Otherwise, be steadfast and know that God knows how to take care of His people. And God knows how to provide you with the grace and strength so that you can endure victoriously until the end. And even if it means death, we will conquer through death. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, let's move to the second point. All right? I said earlier that John recorded two visions. Uh, so, there are two scenes in chapter 15. The first scene is that of the martyrs. Second scene, in the second vision, John saw the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle or temple of God. Let's read verses 5 to 8 again. After this, I look and the sanctuary, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plates, clothed in pure, bright linen, and golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever, and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plates of the seven angels were finished. Now, let me quickly clarify some terms uh, used in this passage. The tent of weakness, I mean, it's peculiar in ESV. Since I'm using ESV, I, I, I need to exp uh, explain this. The tent of weakness is actually the tabernacle of testimony. You read other versions, it's a tabernacle of testimony. The word testimony or weakness refers uh, to the two stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments, Okay, it's called the tablets of, of, of witness or the tablets of testimony. Now, these two tablets are kept in an ark in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle or in the temple of, of, of God, right? So, the other thing is, before the temple was built, God's presence dwelled in the tabernacle. His presence. Not that God dwells there. He put His name there. He put His presence there uh, in the tabernacle. And, and the tabernacle is essentially a mobile temple. They wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. They got to carry the, that tabernacle along with them. So that's the idea. Only when Israel settled down, they become entrenched in their land. They have their own kings. They are economically strong and all that. They built a temple thereafter. All right? That's the first thing I, 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 uh, you, know, you need to know. The, in the original Greek, the word for century here in verse 5 is the word for holy of holies. It's a word for holy of holies. Now, this is the most holy place. The most holy place in the tabernacle and the temple. So, in this vision, John saw the sanctuary open. John saw the holy of holies open. And out came seven angels. Uh, you, you just imagine they queue up and they start coming out, you know, glorious. Uh, they come out with seven angels with seven plates. These seven plates are not diseases or pandemics. We think of plates, we always think of epidemics and all that kind. But these are not. Literally, in the original Greek, it means blows or wounds or calamities. Okay? So it's beyond pandemic, beyond sicknesses and diseases. Okay? These are powerful disasters that will strike the world with deadly impact. And we are further told that these plates are placed on seven golden Bowls, described as a seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. Now, can you remember, can you remember reading about the golden bowls elsewhere in the book of Revelation? Can you remember? There are two occasions in which golden bowls were mentioned. The first occasion is in Revelation 5.8. And when he had taken the scroll, when the lamb, when Jesus had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp 
and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then we next read about this golden bowl in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, golden censer, a golden bowl. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Now, on both these occasions, the golden bowls are filled with what? Incense. What does the incense represent? On both occasions in those verses, we are told that they represent the prayers of the saints. So on both of these occasions, the golden bowls, are, I want you to notice, on both of these occasions, the golden bowls are mentioned just before the unleashing of the judgments. On the first occasion, it was the golden bowls were mentioned before the seven seals judgment begin. On the second occasion, the golden bowls were again mentioned before the seven trumpets judgment begins. So now, in chapter 15, on this third occasion, it was before the seven bowls judgment begin. Okay, the only difference is this. The bowls now don't carry incense. They don't carry the prayers of the saints, but they carry the fury, the anger, the wrath of, 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 of God. But I'll submit to you that they mean one and the same thing. They mean one and the same thing. How? Let me ask you a question. What do you think is a primary prayer request of the tribulations martyrs? What do you think is a prim their primary prayer request during the tribulation? Justice. They want justice. They are not praying for grace and mercy. They are praying for justice. They want vengeance. That God who is holy and righteous and just will judge their enemies and avenge them of their gruesome death. Yes, they are praying for God to take revenge on their behalf. Very holy prayer. But it's a holy prayer. Do you know there's a place for that? The wicked ought to be judged because the wicked has caused a lot of bad things happening to a lot of innocent people. Okay, they ought to be judged. It's a holy prayer. The saints' prayer for justice and vengeance are the incense collected in these golden bowls. Their prayers for justice and vengeance are the, prayer, are, are the incense collected in these bowls. In chapter 5, we notice that when the saints cry out to the Lord, when the tribulation martyrs cry out to the Lord, God says, wait, 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 wait. Not so fast. You've got to wait for a little while more. But in chapter 15, the time is right. And as Jesus readies himself to act in judgments, these prayers are now pictured as the wrath of God. These prayers are now pictured as a wrath of God. The golden bowls full of prayers are now full of the wrath of God. It's like prayers are converted to the wrath of God. Because God is about to take action. God is about to mete out His justice, His vengeance on the wicked of the world. So here in Revelation chapter 15, we see that seven angels are being prepared to pour out the seven bowls full of the wrath of God. In chapter 16, which we're going to talk about in my next sermon, these seven angels will pour out the bowls of wrath on the earth. And we are told that this, uh, and, and, and uh, I, I, we are told that they are being pulled out in a, in, in a most rapid fashion. And this will be the most intense of the three series of judgments during the tribulation period. When the bold judgments are completed, the wrath of God is finished. The wrath of God is completed. The tribulation will end and our Lord Jesus Christ will return to establish His millennial kingdom. It has been a long sermon. Conclusion. Okay, in conclusion, let me ask you a question. Have you wondered, have you ever wondered if your prayers are important? Have you ever wondered, are your prayers even necessary? Since God will always do what He wills to do. I mean, he's, he's sovereign, right? He wants to do, he will do, you know. So why pray? Why do we have to pray according to the will of God? 
So is our, are our prayers necessary? Are our prayers important? I want you to notice that before each series of judgment, like what I've said earlier, we are presented with the imageries of the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Why? We've got to ask ourselves the question, why? And the reason is this. God requires the prayers of the saints before he can act. I didn't say he will act. He can act. God requires the prayers of the saints before he can act. You hear me correctly. God requires us, Christians, believers, the saints, to beseech him, to pray, to petition so that he can act according to his will. God requires that. It's almost like God requires our permission. Why do we think that is the case? It is because God has delegated the authority of the earth to mankind. To Adam and Eve, right from the very beginning. But of course, Satan usurped their authority. But men still have that when we are Christians, we pray according to God's will. God will act accordingly. God will move the heart of his saints to, to pray accordingly so that he can act according to his will. It's a little bit convoluted, but that's how it is. You see, though God has the power to act, he will not act unless and until the saints pray according to his will. And then he will act. God respects the fact that his, the, the, the authority over the earth has already been given to men. And that's the reason why we have to pray. Okay? That is the reason why we are shown the imagery of the golden bowls before each series of judgment. And that is the reason why prayer is important and necessary before God will intervene on our behalf in our lives. Many questions have been asked. God, you already know my need. You know I'm suffering. Why do I need to pray? But God wants us to pray so that He can act. God will not intrude. God will not go against your will. You want it, you ask. God say, I will respond. I'm sovereign, but I also make you, in a sense, you have your free will and you have to ask. And that is the reason uh, why we ought always to pray that His will and His good purposes be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So let us always be praying that the will of God be accomplished in our lives and also in the world. And especially so, as we come to the end of this present age, let's be mindful to pray according to the will of God. Okay, don't be afraid of what's coming, but rejoice because our redemption draws near. Rejoice because we are about to have our glorified body. It'll be exciting to be in a glorified body. I'm looking forward to that. Are you? Amen? Amen. Shall we all stand? Shall we all stand and worship the Lord?